I wanted to share with you today a little bit about what we're thinking and what we're, you know, I'm driving our teams on inside. So I, I'm the CTO for the IT division of uh, Schneider, and it's uh, uh, one of six divisions. And in that role, I take direct responsibility for that portfolio, which includes UPSs, racks, cooling equipment. Uh, but I also have indirect responsibility for the entire solution going in, MV, LV, uh, anything inside of the Schneider portfolio. So I'm really trying to share with you here how we're thinking about things from a, the overall data center market, some of the things that we're seeing coming, and at least our perspective. So, you know, there's uh, certainly many other perspectives out there uh, for anyone who's at DCD. There's a lot of, lot of discussions going on right now. Out of curiosity, uh, how many people are at DCD and sat through my presentation yesterday? Okay, so we got a handful, mainly Schneider people, a few customers. Okay, so because what you're going to see today, there's going to be some repetition with what I presented yesterday, just in fair warning. Um, but I am going to go into more detail on some of the things that I skipped in the, for those who sat through it. So, uh, and I got to try and land this one in an hour. So we'll see, see, you know, I'm notorious for finishing on time. Not really, no. Uh, so we'll see how we go. So I, I title this, you know, I, we talk about innovation, and one of the things I always drive our teams on is, you know, we don't want to be innovating just to innovate, just to come up with great ideas. We want to be innovating so that we're coming up with something that's going to have an impact on the business and on the market. And not just our business, but also our customers' business. So are we working on something that's going to bring value that we can actually deliver and realize is an area that we want to focus on it. And I talk about an 80% performance, and I'm going to walk you through a little bit of where, you know, uh, we've started challenging the teams around thinking in these types of terms, okay? Because I really do think we are uh, hitting an inflection point. Everyone says that every year, but there's some things happening right now that I think are driving us into some different directions, and we need to start maybe broadening our thought process a little. So we went back, and I went back to 2006. I wanted it to be 2007, so I could say 10 years, but I had to, you know, we had to go to 11. Um, and, uh, but if you take a look at it, the term cloud computing did not exist before 2006. It did not exist. It was invented in 2006. Amazon Web Services did not exist before 2006. So to me, in 11 years, to go from not having cloud computing even as a concept to where we are today is just really just a tremendous change in the industry. Okay? And certainly, we're, we're seeing that hit us from all, all, all directions. And what's fascinating with that is uh, if I, we went back and said, geez, for fun, what do we think a data center typically looked like in 2006? And we just picked a couple. I mean, everybody has their own. My favorite is the complex cooling. You can't see it, right? But that's a guy spray, spraying water on the, uh, on the condenser to make sure you get some extra cooling out of it, right? You know? Um, yeah, some of you built, had some data center strategies like this. Is that, yeah? Okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's N plus something. Um, Mark said, is that N plus two? So it's, you know, but disorganized layouts, we didn't really talk about containment. You know, you got the guy freezing, and the, you know, how many, I remember putting a coat on before walking through data centers, right? That was only 10 years ago when that was not unusual to see. And if you talk about now, we've gone from talking about cloud computing to, you know, talking about edge, right? Now cloud computing, that's passe. We all, we all know about cloud. Now we've got to figure out the edge, right? That's the next big challenge. Um, this thing about hyper-converged systems and some of the things happening at that IT layer between open compute, some of the things that I see happening in hyper-converged is having a real impact on what's happening at the IT level. And I think as an industry, we need to start thinking more about what is happening at the IT level and what's the impact going to be on us as a physical infrastructure providers. And we need to start thinking about that as well, simply because of what's happening. Um, and for 20 years, we've been talking about IT and facilities will inevitably merge. So what's nice about that term is inevitable is a long time from now, apparently, right? Because we still see separation between IT and facilities. But certainly when you look at what some of the hyperscale guys are doing, when they're designing their data centers, they are comprehending, for the most part, what's happening at the IT level with the facilities much better than other people have in the past. So you really, I think we are starting to see that uh, traditional, um, uh, thing break down. So uh, traditional barrier breakdown. So if I take a look and I started, we said, you know, if I compare that, how have we done as an industry? So we just picked a model, and I always give, you know, because you know, guys like you always challenge me on what's the assumptions in your model, so I always pre present them. But we took a typical data center and we said, let's just take a look at three things that were brought into, into the market in the last 10 years. I mean, this isn't everything. You can challenge different assumptions, but we just said, let's go look at these three, which are ones that were close to our, our interest of UPS improvements, containment, 
and then using economization instead of traditional chilled water, what did that have as an impact on efficiency inside of a data center? And when you model it out, what that gets you is an 80% improvement in effect, an 80% reduction in losses that you have as an efficiency. And we can get down to 1.17. We know we can do better than that. I'm sure people in here have uh, done theoretical designs, at least, who get below that. But just for the sake of our model to illustrate the point, and generally, those data centers are, are about half the cost, okay, from what you saw. You know, and this is rough numbers. People can challenge it. You know, on our teams, as we modeled out, they say, Kevin, it's really 20, 25 percent. It's 50 percent. You know, but regardless, we've seen a tremendous uh, improvement in what the cost of a data center is. So you know, that's what we've done, and the question really becomes, if we got an 80% improvement in the last 10 years, what's the next 80%? And these are questions I'm starting to challenge our team on because I don't think these strategies, which we've been doing for the last 10 years, if we continue doing them, will not get us the next 80%. So we're going to need to start thinking about this problem a little bit differently. And I think instead of efficiency, we've got to start thinking about overall energy consumption. And uh, I'll hit on this theme a little bit. And what is the, you know, the green impact? So if you take this efficiency improvement, that's 60,000 trees a year, okay? That's equivalent to the embedded carbon in 60,000 trees. And I think these are gonna be the types of metrics that are gonna be important going forward. So we're not gonna abandon PUE, we're not gonna abandon the efficiency ones, we're gonna need to do that, but we're gonna start getting challenged by the government regulations and so forth to look more broadly at this, at this challenge. There we go. And, uh, you know, and, you know we look at, and this, this, this is going to be dependent, this assumption is dependent on one thing, which is that human beings will continue to have this insatiable demand for data. So if that assumption is true, and this is the data that's showing that, you know, we're heading for a real challenge as an industry if we don't find a way to minimize our footprint. You know, the governments and everyone simply will not allow us as an industry, the IT industry in general and data centers, to take up more and more of the power consumption of the grid. We have to find a way to lower our energy consumption relative to this growth rate. So this is gonna be the challenge that we start running into. And this idea of edge computing, you know, I, I tend to try and simplify things and I've been accused of oversimplifying things at times. If you've been in the conversations around edge computing, there was, you know, great discussions yesterday, DCD, uh, uh, you know, there was a beehive analogy, which I'm not quite sure I followed, but. There's all sorts of interesting things about people trying to define the edge. But in my mind, this is the model that we're gonna go to is almost anything you do, there's three types of data centers in the world today. The centralized cloud, which I think we all know, regional edge, which is where I kind of put most co-location type facilities or traditional enterprise facilities. And then the third one, which is the new one, is the local edge. And the way I think about this is what's been called in the past local wiring closets or server rooms is what's going to evolve into having to be treated like a data center. Because at the end of the day, if what's most important is my connection into the internet, whether it's a Chromebook, whether it's an Android phone, an iPhone, that first connection point that I get to is the local edge. And if that goes down, my experience as a user is poor. And we, a couple of people hit on that this morning. So we have to start focusing on what is that end user experience and are they getting the experience that they want? It really doesn't matter if at the regional edge you had a power outage that forced you to go to generator. If I'm still providing the service to that customer, that's not a failure. So our definition of failure is going to need to change. And Lex got into that some. That's what he's trying to get to with ASDA. Like, you know, do I need 2N? Does it really make sense? I think he's heading in that direction with some of those thoughts. That's that we're, work we're participating on, by the way, with the green grid. So, you know, you start looking at this now, and, and, and cloud computing, the net implication of this, I believe, combined with edge and all the trends that you've, you've heard about today, is this is becoming more complex, not less. I used to go to these, these uh, uh, conferences and people talked about cloud computing is going to simplify our lives. I don't think so. I think it's made it more complex because now I've got more things to work with. If I'm an enterprise guy, I've got to worry about my local edge. I've got to worry about the stuff I have in colos. I've got to worry about the stuff I still have in my own data centers. And now I've got to worry about the applications in the cloud. Ten years ago, they didn't have to worry about that. Ten years ago, they worried about what's happening in my data center. And they really didn't have to worry as much about the other areas. So I think this is some of the things that we're seeing. And, and uh, I have a whole paper that we've written on this and presented, but we call it resiliency at the edge. Um, and if you do the math, if you take you know, some assumptions, you know, it's typical tier three data center, 99.98% availability, you'd expect 1.6 hours of downtime per year. And you'd say you're doing pretty well. But if you take that thing and connect it out to a tier one edge data center, okay, your downtime now for the users dependent on that edge data center is 31 hours. 
So what starts happening is the edge, the local edge is what's going to dominate the equation in terms of someone's availability. So uh, as you start looking at that, so what's going to drive the performance over the next 80% and uh, what's going to be the impact of edge computing? We have to deal with this as an industry because we're all going to start working in this much more hybrid environment, much more complex environment would be my uh, position. So what does that mean? It means you've got to start looking at a larger ecosystem. I think we've done, and we will continue to drive efficiency on UPSs and our products, and we need to, you know, we're going to keep driving on that. We will continue to do that. You know, and there's things you can do with machine learning to improve performance, but that's not going to be enough. So we have to do more than that, and you've got to look at this broader ecosystem, and it really comes down to three things in my view, which is what are you going to do on the supply side to work with the utilities? Okay? What are we going to do on the demand side on the loads that are happening inside the data center? And then what are the new enabling technologies that we need to be looking at and understanding and embracing? And I'm trying to, you know, even with our own teams, start getting people thinking in these terms. So as we start thinking about it that way, uh, whoops, no, I'm trigger happy. Um, you know, I, I kind of bundle it this way. Say, first of all, our priorities need to be, one, how do I ensure that we're, we're deploying best practices? All the things so that we can achieve, uh, you know, everything that we've done over the last 10 years we should be able to do without any problem today. So how do we ensure that we're getting that? And here are some strategies. I'm going to go into each one of these. What are the cooling strategies that we can look at? And I'm going to dive in a little bit on liquid cooling because um, uh, that's, you know, as somebody said to me once, that's the technology of the future and always will be. And then I get the mainframe guys coming to me going, you know, we did that in the 70s. You know, if anyone ever, know, and I talk about this, every mainframe guy I ever meet, anything we ever talk about, they say, we were doing that in the 70s. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic with them. Um, impact on the grid, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things we're seeing there. And then at the end of the day, uh, and this is going to get back to, Mark talked about ecostructure this morning, Dave talked about it last night, I think Dave said something, you're going to hear about this until you throw up or something like that, you know, so I'm not looking to do that to anybody, but certainly this is a big part of why you see this focus from Schneider on software. So, uh, so those are kind of the four strategies that we see out there. So, uh, you know, so ensuring best practice across this hybrid environment. So again, you know, thinking about not only the regional data center, centralized cloud, but also this local edge. And the, the real dilemma that I think we're facing is, you know, for the most part, I think we all know how to build a data center, right? And I go to a centralized data center. I've been through a lot of these. I have some that I've gone through, and I've had an armed guard following me around. Right? I mean, we know how to build a data center that's safe and secure, that's got man traps, security guards, monitored all the time. You've got redundancy of critical, right? We had all these organized things that we make sure is happening. And then back to our edge story, you take that and you connect it to something that looks like that. Does that make any sense? Okay. What is, the, what is the first step in cybersecurity? I have a theory on this. It's physical security. If anybody can get access to something, plug into the network, it's all over, right? If I can get on the network, I can do all sorts of evil things. Which, by the way, most of the security breaches that you hear about is because they got on the network through some clever way. So I, I talk about this, and you, know, you go into some typical retail stores, and you know, the janitor's got access into the network closet. But yet in the colo, you know, the co-location facility, you take their name, serial number, right? How many children do you have? What's the name of your firstborn? Right? But then the janitor can walk in. I mean, this is, this is some craziness that's going on. So we've got to address this somehow. And this is where you see us making this investment in prefab and in micro data centers. Because what this is really trying to ensure is whatever's best practices, that's what's getting deployed. It eliminates variability. And that's really where we're seeing the interest come in on prefab and, and micro data center, which to me, prefab and micro data center, the only difference is size. You know, if I have one or two racks, that's kind of a micro data center. If I go to a prefab, you know, to me, that starts becoming a little bit, you know, you know up to 100 kilowatts I can fit in one little box, right? So, but in general, they're solving the same problem, which is delivering something that's uh, secure and we know is designed the right way. And we're seeing this starting to happen. And, uh, you know, here's one example, and this is one that looks like a piece of furniture on the side, right? Because the other thing is the idea that I have a dedicated room for these is becoming obsolete, I think. We're seeing a lot of customers where I want to be able to deploy my micro data center and just have it over here in the corner. Like, why do I need to have a special room and locked and I don't want to deal with that complexity. Just let me, give me, give me that and let me manage it remotely. So, um, you know, in their medical center, they saved $150,000 is what this customer estimated because they're able to leverage uh, the cooling that was there and they didn't have to do a dedicated room. 
So again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Prefab's been talked a lot about in the industry. I can tell you our business, we continue to see some momentum on this. And it's, and it's interesting to see where it's evolving. It, we're seeing a lot of interest on the edge around prefab, okay? And again, some of these can be pretty big edge. My definition of edge is 100 kilowatts or below. We have other people who define it as 500 kilowatts. Okay. So what your definition of local edge is varies depending on how you look at it. But at the end of the day, you know, shortens planning and implementation, availability, security, efficiency you expected. These are the reasons people are going with prefab. And it's, and it's being able to deploy in unique places that they couldn't deploy before. So that we're, we're definitely seeing momentum in that area. And, and again, we, we have power skids. We're doing big power skids into data centers, and I think that's pretty well accepted now in the industry. And we, we perform that for certain customers. But we continue to focus on this, not because of the big data centers, but we're also focusing on how do we solve this problem of securing the edge and making sure that the edge is secure and available. Um, and just a little bit of uh, propaganda on the different sizes that we have. But you got lots of different options and so forth on those. And again, uh, here's another example of an edge application where the customer saw an annual cooling cost reduction of more than 10%, right? Just by putting in prefab, which meant they were following best practice, the thing was going to operate as it was designed, that's the type of savings that they got. Okay, so there it goes. So in the, in the context, so that kind of solves, you know, of some of the work that we're doing on the, on the edge. And then one of the things a few years ago, you know, I'm a big believer in containment, and we've had debates of hot aisle versus cold aisle. How many people think hot aisle is better, just for fun? How many people think cold aisle is better? Some people aren't raising their hand. I want an arm wrestling contest later. You know, and at the end of the day, I have my opinions on it. But the point is, is that no matter what, if you contain, you're, you, you clearly are going to get better, better, better performance out of the data center, regardless of which one you pick. So the question I had for myself is I kept walking around these data centers, and I never saw any containment. And I would talk to people and say, if it's so compelling, right, and if you look at our metrics, I mean, containment gets you an awful lot in efficiency, but I didn't see anybody implementing it. And even today, I still don't see it to the level that I think would make sense. And the question was, why? So we started challenging ourselves and our customers on it. We uh, did some deeper dives with customers. And this is the type of words that we heard. And, and, and we were really targeting kind of the co-location market and saying, because that's, you know, it's complex for a typical colo, not, not like the purpose-built one for hyperscales, but traditional kind of retail applications. Because the standard thing I always hear is, I never know what my customer is going to bring in. So I can't do a design that's too restrictive because I never know what they're going to bring. Um, we, have this, we had this dynamic where I think, you know, 10, 15 years ago, our philosophy was, uh, you know, install a bunch of empty racks, and then somebody will bring in the IT equipment and install the IT equipment in the racks. Well, that kind of disappeared somewhere along the line, where we're seeing now people want to be able to roll racks in fully configured. Um, and, uh, you know, and then a lot of people just said, hey, we looked at containment, but the, the capital cost is too expensive. We, we just couldn't make it work, right? Maybe the economic model was wrong. I don't know. But this is some of the things we started hearing. So we said, we want to solve that problem. So here's what we said, uh, you know, not flexible enough, and some of the things was, you know, hey, look, if anything's directly attached to the rack, it causes a problem, because I lose flexibility in being able to do things. I can't finish the design until I get the racks in, because I can't mount everything. Um, I don't like people cutting and drilling on site. Right? We have some pictures coming up. You know, where, you know, some people are doing containment with the meat locker flaps. I don't know if that translates or if that's an Americanism, but, you know, the plastic flaps hanging down. You know, and you have a guy up on a ladder trimming the flaps, and then, you know, one of your customer walks into the data center and sees a guy with a tool belt doing that. You know, they're like, I don't just don't want my customer to get that kind of experience, so I'd rather not do containment. I mean, this is a real story I heard from somebody. So, you know, we, we saw all these types of problems. How do I do ads, moves, and changes? Um, so we started boiling it down and saying, uh, here's some other, you know, problems with that. I think I've kind of explained all of these. Um, and, and a big one is, you know, putting IT in an unfinished data center, you know, increases risk of damage, right? And this was a big concern. You know, Kevin, I got, a, I got a rack with a half a million dollars of IT equipment. I don't want anybody doing construction near it. And by the way, it's a customer of mine, but I'm liable. So I don't care what the containment is. It's not worth that, right? So this, is, this is message was coming through to us about how do I minimize the impact to our customers. Here's some pictures of guys, you know, climbing up on ladders, trying to get stuff to work. And we started saying, you know, there's problems with hanging stuff from the ceiling. How do we minimize that? as much as possible. Because first of all, if you go in and you buy a building and you got to reinforce the roof, that costs you money, right? And also, you know, it's tough to install that stuff, you know, we, we think. So we were trying to, these are the kind of things we were looking at. Um, people using raised floors in ways they weren't intended. And again, the construction work. So this is uh, why we just announced this week what we call HyperPod. I can tell you we've uh, already deployed this at a, 
uh, two different sites, and we just received an order from a second customer, um, well-known names in the industry. And uh, you know, it, it's basically trying to get to these benefits of how do I get an efficient data center by doing containment? How do I quickly install containment in infrastructure before the IT racks are delivered so that I can have everything, as much as possible in place so that then when the customer's ready, they just roll in, right? And in some cases, a co-location provider told us, they said, look, if I can get all of the infrastructure ready for them, there's a benefit to me because I can start billing them immediately. Because one of the problems they had is that, and I'm sure this doesn't happen to any of you, right? But uh, there's their customer signed a contract Contract said, when you have the infrastructure ready, I will start paying you. But they couldn't get the infrastructure ready until the racks were there. And then the customer was three or four months late getting their racks to arrive. So they lost three or four months of revenue waiting for that customer. This solution alone, that paid for this solution. Because it allowed them to put in the full infrastructure and start billing the customer, because they were ready. Okay? So these are some of the stories we started hearing. Um, our, our model showed a 15% CapEx savings. So that was enough for us where we started getting excited about it. Um, and we think it's about a 20% time savings. So this is a model that we put together. Um, but I think some of our initial installs are proving that out as well. So, you know, so this is another way to try and make it easier to get these best practices implemented inside of data centers. So this is why we were investing in it. And you'll hear more about Hyperpod. But these are some of the uh, things we're trying to do. A little bit on cooling. So I apologize. A little bit of a sales pitch. But you know, we can't resist. So I, uh, you know, we've done a lot of work on economization uh, as a company, and, and I just want to hit on this quickly. You know, I think you probably all know this story. This is a comparison of indirect versus uh, direct versus chillers, glycol cool. No matter how you do it, I mean, indirect and air economization gets you a pretty good partial PUE, right? And this says 1.04, because I know you can't read it, um, because of the white on green. And then if you take uh, indirect and you go across London, Chicago, Singapore, you get similar numbers. So you get very good efficiency out of air economization. So we're trying to make it as practical as possible for people to implement that technology. And, and we've uh, made an investment in, in, in that product to do so. And one of the things that we've uh, discovered as we were working with different customers on this is you need to think about when you go to air economization compared to a chilled water system, you actually free up IT space. You free up load for the IT. So we modeled it out. In our model, you said uh, you had 1,300 kilowatts available for IT equipment. Simply by going with indirect air economization, you got an 11% was an 11% increase, I think, if you do the math. So 1,480. Uh, so just by implementing air economization, you actually free up power. So on your power bus, you, instead of consuming so much of the main bus for the, the mechanical systems, you can free that up to go and work and uh, provide uh, more power to IT. So this was something else that we thought was an interesting angle. So, uh, so we continue to invest in that. Oh, there's the 11%. I knew it was there somewhere. So this is uh, you know, one of the things that gets us excited. And then there's also liquid cooling. So again, the, you know, as I joked about earlier, technology of the future and always will be. Why, why do we think that's changing? And uh, there's certainly, I think you're seeing a, a much greater interest coming right now in liquid cooling. I'm hearing a lot more about it. I'm hearing a lot more questions. And we start looking at it and saying, well, why is this happening? And why is there this, you know, this, this guy, the liquid cooling renaissance? Why is there this renewed interest in a technology that's, for the most part, been around forever? And uh, these are some of the trends that I think are pushing us in that direction. I, you know, I also get the sense that, you know, what's happening on the chips is changing as well. So GPU are now replacing CPUs. I think the CPUs, Intel, we're starting to see signs that you know, for the last 10 years, they've been able to hold the power consumption of the chips pretty level. We're seeing signs now that they're no longer able to do that. And they will start increasing the, the, what's called the TDP, the thermal dissipation power of the chips themselves. But either way, I get very nervous about refrigerants uh, in general. There's an awful lot of government regulations around it. There's a lot happening here in Europe trying to get us to change refrigerants. Um, you know, how do I, again, I think this overall theme of reducing costs and improving efficiency. And then we do have a lot of people talking about increasing densities. Right? And I think in the past 10 years, you know, for the last 15 years, the industry has been talking about densities are going up. I mean, I remember seeing graphs saying by, I think by now we'd have 100 kilowatt racks, if I remember some of the projections, which some of those were a little silly, right, looking back on it. Um, what's different now, though, I think, is because you're, people are, you're seeing more of these purpose-built data centers, as I like to call them. And a hyperscale is an example of a purpose-built data center where they have a specific application they're going to write, they put the IT in it, and they drop, it, drop uh, and they design the data center around that. When you do that, you know, the economics start working more in your favor to go to higher densities. And higher densities, in my terms, you know, 
High density is anything north of 15 kilowatts per rack. You see people playing around with 40, 45 nits. And I do think that's, that is really specific when they're doing, a, again, what I call the purpose-built data center. Um, generally, if I go into generic co-location environments, we still see densities around five kilowatts per rack, three to five, depending on where you are. Okay, and that number hasn't changed. So we got this dynamic going on that I, I think you're gonna see some changes happening. So when we talk about liquid cooling, um, again, we simplify it down. There's two types, direct liquid cooling, where you're putting water or some kind of dielectric fluid directly onto the chip, and you see a lot of people doing that. And then, you know, you can take a, take a system and fully immerse it. Right, so I take the motherboard and actually have it sitting in some kind of dielectric fluid, and I'm running the boards that way. And, it, and it, there's, and by the way, if, I don't know how many of you have looked in the liquid cooling market, but this is, a, this is like a religious war that's going on inside this market about which one's the right, right solution. Um, we kind of look at it and say, I think you're gonna see both out in the marketplace, um, because there's benefits and drawbacks with each one. I can tell you though, if you are looking to optimize energy consumption, Immersed cooling wins, okay, and I'll show you that in a second. What's great about the, uh, you know, I won't read through all these, you know, you know, we'll share the slides, but what's great about the uh, direct liquid cooling, or cooling on the chips, is it's very easy to take a current server and current supply chain that I have and modify it for that solution, okay? So for the typical server guys, it makes it easy to, tomorrow they can take any server and make it work with liquid cooling. All right. Immersed cooling is a little bit more disruptive to the supply chain because the motherboards can't be the same. But the advantage is you get rid of all the fans, you get rid of all of the rest of the cooling infrastructure. Because in direct liquid cooling, I'm only cooling the chips. Everything else still needs air cooling. So I still have to have an architecture to do air cooling. If I go to fully immersed, much more disruptive for the industry, much more disruptive for the supply chains. But when I do that, I eliminate all the cooling in effect. Because now all I need is a dry cooler sitting outside. Okay, so this is uh, going to be interesting, I think. I think you're going to, you know, personally, we, we don't, you know, I see both happening. You know, it's certainly interesting with the disruption that the uh, Immerse gives. Uh, we've run a model on this. I, I'm sure we'll make this available as a white paper if we haven't already. Um, you know, but we're seeing is that even with today's technology, as we look at it, the TCO is lower, right, going to Immerse cooling. And we've been running this mod with these types of models for a while, and it's only now that we're starting to see it tilt towards liquid cooling. So this is getting us a little bit more excited, right, than maybe where we were 10 years ago. Um, and also, again, when I get into the idea of a purpose-built data center, so now, you know, again, you know, in the old days, if I talked about immersed cooling, I had to go and get IBM, Dell, HP. I had to get all these guys lined up to go and do it. Well, now, in the context of, uh, you know, if I'm going and building one and I'm getting my own motherboard made, I can get that motherboard made to support liquid cooling just as easily as I can get it to do air. So that's a different market dynamic, is the supply chain disruption that immersed cooling gave 10 years ago is minimized now because of that, because the supply chain has changed in the industry. So these are some of the things that we're looking at. Um, here are the things that are holding us back. So the lack of standards, so again, not all IT is compatible. There's questions about spinning disk and how do I get spinning disk to work? What about my networking gear? What about storage in general? So there's still things that we have to work through as an industry if we want to realize the true benefit of this. And then also maintenance is a big one. Is how do I get the maintenance on these solutions to be as easy as it is on air-cooled? Or at least pretty darn close. Because if the maintenance takes a lot longer or is a lot more complex, then people don't want to, then that's going to be resistance. So these are things that we think we need to solve. We've gotten, uh, we made a few years ago an investment in Isotope, which is a company that uh, uh, we thought had a great technology. We've been working with them over the last number of years to try and mature that technology and address some of these challenges that we see. And, uh, you know, we we're actually feel like we're making some pretty good progress. So this is an area that we're, um, I think this is closer than, uh, certainly closer than where it was 10 years ago. And uh, uh, so we're, we're, we're excited to keep working on this. So this is an area we're investing in. And again, I don't make a prediction on when or how it'll come to market, but uh, it seems like a pretty good bet that something's going to happen. So, um, okay, makes sense at this point? Okay, so now we're gonna switch from cooling into power, right? And, uh, you know, by the way, you know, I'm the CTO of the IT division, just so you know, I'm actually a mechanical engineer, right? So the, the cooling part of this is most exciting. I mean, there's nothing worse than being a mechanic, an American mechanical engineer inside of a really big power French company, right, you know? Um, you know and they're recording this, so I can't say any French jokes, I'll get in real trouble, so. Uh, you know, so, but uh, I'll do my best on the power side. So one thing that we're observing happening, and I think this is, uh, 
I haven't heard many people uh, talking about this, but uh, IT equipment is becoming much more proportional to the load. So 10 years ago, if I turned on a Dell or an HP server, they took about 60% of their, their rated power just by turning them on. It could sit there and do nothing, but it would draw that much power, right? Now, both of these only take 11%. All right, so what does that mean? What it means is the power, we're gonna start seeing much more variable power on the demand side, right? So if I install a data center, it used to be a very stable load, utilities loved it, right? You know, you put it in, stable load, not many peaks. I think data centers are gonna become more peaky. And, uh, and there's some other people talking about this. This is uh, uh, some publicly available uh, data from Google and from Akamai. You know, this is going, I know you can't read this, but to give you, it's going, showing uh, the peakiness from 300 to 400. This is going from 200 to 300. And, uh, you know, and I think you're gonna see that probably continue because we've gotta focus on how do we minimize energy consumption. I can tell you at the IT level, there's tons of startups right now that are chasing this problem is how do I reduce my IT footprint when I don't need it and then expand it when I do, right? An elastic cloud, there's all sorts of fancy terms around this, but there's a lot of people working to make that very dynamic. So not only will the servers be going up and down, but if I can consolidate VMs and, and even turn servers off, think about the physical infrastructure and what you're gonna see in terms of your utilization, if this starts playing out the way that uh, it seems like it might. So this is, uh, you know, uh, something that we're also watching and talking to a bunch of startups about. Um, you know, so you, this brings you into this whole idea of energy storage applications, and this is where, you know, what is the impact of the data center on the grid, okay? So the, you know, the, you know there's, there's a lot of work happening just trying to define how, how do we, you know, how do we even do energy storage on the grid for stabilization of frequency and what have you? And when I started thinking about this, I said, you know, the data center is gonna have to adapt to the grid. We have to start thinking about it that way. And I've corrected that because I actually think what's gonna happen is the grid is gonna need to adapt to the data centers. Because when we're putting in some of the numbers that Andrew Jay was talking about, you know, 1,000 megawatts or whatever it was in Washington, was it 1,000 megawatts in Washington, D.C.? I mean, you know, that's like, you gotta build a grid just to support that. It's not that the data center needs to modify, it's uh, there's uh, some other things that need to occur. So we're looking into this, um, you know, and we think a lot of these services, you know, we're trying to find a way, not find a way, but we think the UPS, in a way, you should think of it as an energy storage device. That's what it is. It's got, let, you know, it's got batteries on it, and in effect, we can use the UPS to do peak shaving. So I can peak shave the demand side very easily um, with just doing some software changes to it. And there's all these other benefits that you think you bring, you know, with utilities, you can get demand side charges, uh, you know, time of, you know, we're looking into time of day shifting for when the power, when we're consuming the power off the grid, maybe we, you know, with lithium ion batteries, I can do, you know, four hours of runtime. We're having discussions with people about, should I put in a UPS with four hours of runtime? Um, and uh, so these are all interesting things that you can do with the utilities uh, that we're trying to understand better. Um, Sorry. And, then the, uh, and then the key thing here is, uh, you know, lithium ion is the key technology enabling this. So we've started uh, on a path towards lithium ion. I can tell you we announced this coming up a year and a half ago now, I think is when we announced it originally. And uh, the number of people who came in who were interested in it caught us by surprise. So the market's adopting lithium ion much faster than I would have guessed. And we're starting to see these conversations come up very quickly in terms of how do I use it for peak shaving? How do I use it for demand side management? And I think that is going to be more uh, of a concern as, a, as if I'm right and that the, the uh, demand side of the data centers will get much more uh, uh, dynamic. So, you know, cost equations keep changing. A third the size, a third the weight, three times the cost is the typical uh, numbers. But you're seeing that uh, that equation keeps changing every, you know, every quarter as time goes by. So lithium ion's getting uh, less expensive. So we are working very aggressively to get all of our products uh, compatible with lithium ion and, and build in intelligence to do some of these other uh, things. Um, one of the other things that we're investigating is uh, we started saying, hey, if I wanted to get rid of my generators, how many people love generators? Anybody, you love your generator? Well, we gotta talk later. You're the only one who's ever said yes anytime I've asked that question, right? I mean, I don't know anybody who likes their generators, right? You know, there's all sorts of local regulations you gotta deal with, how often can you run them, right? There's, so we've had some people come to us and say, hey, you know, what if I just, you know, bought a bunch of batteries and uh, had enough runtime to run for a certain period of time instead of buying generators? Would that be acceptable? And I don't know the answer to that question, but we're looking at, you know, where's that trade-off? 
So right now the trade-off is around, it uh, looks like in this model came out to around, uh, you know, somewhere in the two to three hour range is where we see the break even. So instead of buying generators, you can buy three hours of runtime. And then the question becomes, is that enough? I don't know the answer to that question, right? But I think in certain cases you will see people start to design ways in this complex hybrid environment with application sharing and turning things off. You know, if it gets out to three, four, or five hours, how many times have you had a power outage that lasted longer than four or five hours? And when those happen, you know, depending where you are, you know, I can tell you in the United States, if it goes for four or five hours, it's probably out for days, right? So there's a lot of thought and discussion that we're having with different people about, hey, how long is enough? I don't know if this is going to win or if there's going to be another solution, but I can tell you these are conversations that we're thinking about. Um, and then renewable energy is interesting. You know, there's a lot of talk about renewable energy. I don't have a lot on this outside of the one thing I can say is every renewable energy that I'm aware of, and if somebody has something different, then let me know. Every single one of these, though, they do not connect directly into the data center. Every one of these is they built a separate farm that connects into the grid, and then they're getting credit, and that offsets what the data center is consuming. Okay? So again, this gets back to is, you know, as, as we're moving forward, data centers, you know, you know, it's gonna be designed in conjunction with the grid and with these uh, different solutions. And within Schneider, I can tell you, we're already starting to have these conversations across our bigger portfolio. Uh, Mark mentioned, I'll mention in a second, we always looked at, you know, kind of the build, you know, buildings, power, and IT, you know, but we're now starting to engage on, well, what about the grid? And should we be coming in? How do I do a full solution, including maybe the renewable strategy? Okay, so uh, that's what I had on power. So what am I doing? On, I'm not doing bad. So, uh, so that's the third one. So I think, uh, again, just to summarize that discussion is, you know, demand side's gonna get more variable would be uh, a, a likely scenario in the future. So we're gonna need to do, we're gonna need strategies to manage that, smooth that out, right? Because that'll make it easier on the grid. Renewables usually connected into the grid, so if you're looking at a renewable strategy, automatically now you're impacting the grid and the grid's <laughs> adapting to the data center, all right? And then, you know, all sorts of interesting applications that are coming with battery technology, all right? We talk about lithium ion today. I have a team that's out researching new battery technologies and uh, Lex mentioned one yesterday in his <laughs> presentation. So, you know, we have to continue to challenge ourselves as uh, we see these technologies evolve. So, as a result, so now I've got, the, you know, hopefully painted a little bit of a picture of a very complex environment that's coming. Right? If we thought it was complex now, it's not getting easier. So, you know, more interaction with the grid and renewables, right? So I need to understand, you know, so if uh, I've gone and put in a renewable plant that's connected to the grid, and then the, what if that thing's not operating the way that it should, and all of those things are gonna start playing into it. Greater power variability with IT, a mix of complex cooling architectures. Again, I think you're gonna see air, we'll continue to see chilled water, We'll now see direct liquid cooling, and I'm going to see immersed cooling. That would be my bet. Right? Easy man, I, I bet on all the horses. Right? So, um, you know, more sites to manage in the hybrid environment. And by the way, how many people think they're going to be able to exponentially add staff to deal with this complexity? Right? It's no problem, right? It's easy. Hiring people, training them, retaining them, right? You know, it, it, it's a challenge, the people. And at the end of the day, that's gonna be the limiting factor. There's other people talking about this in the industry. And this is why our software has to get better. The software we use today is not good enough to deal with this complexity that I see coming. So we're talking about this, and I, I believe, and this is where we're placing a bet, is the only way I can address this level of complexity and this limitation of people and staff is by going to cloud-based management systems. All right, and this is something that's emerging and um, I think it's some of the industry will work through. But at the end of the day, I need to collect and analyze huge amounts of data. There's an advantage of a cloud-based system versus a, 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 an on-premise only system that we typically use today. So how do I get massive amounts of data coming in? Because we're gonna have massive amounts of data available to us. The problem is how do we collect it and do something with it? How do I remotely monitor and manage all of my sites? We love using retailers as an example here, because I have some examples in a second that I'm gonna show you. But if you're a retailer, and there's an example in a second I'm gonna show you, but it's 2,300 stores. So if you believe my premise, my assertion, that the local edge needs to be treated like a data center, I now have 2,300 data centers that I'm managing if I'm that retailer, right? And that is approximately 40 megawatts of power, okay? That's, that's bigger than their data center that they have is what they're managing. So I think we need to start thinking in those terms, 40 megawatts, how do I do that? And we'll show you some of the results that we got in that example. 
uh, scaling management systems easily without limit. There's always a problem with scalability. You know, I, uh, I tell a story. When we first started getting into, this was years ago, we started making software that, you know, we used to manage two, three, four, five UPSs back in the mid-90s. I've been here this long. It's sad, I know. And then uh, we said, okay, well, that's not good enough. We need to do 10, 20. And eventually we got to, okay, we'll do 10,000. And the day I made the software work with 10,000 devices, I walked up to this customer, and how many did you need? 10,001, right? You guys are very difficult. I just made it for 10,000 and you insisted. So uh, really the cloud architectures are fantastic for this. And you think about, you know, uh, my kids uh, play games online, like I assume, you know, most teenagers do. You know, and you look at the technology they got. I mean, they got thousands of people playing these games. I mean, it is built to scale, this technology. Um, and it's really coming from the gaming side. So uh, that's a big benefit to us. And at the end of the day, if I can collect massive amounts of data, I can put it in the cloud, now I can use big data tools much more easily, and therefore we can start becoming more predictive. Right? And there's easy things to talk about today of, hey, you know, I want to be able to predict when the UPS is having a problem and let's send a guy before we do that. That's easy, uh, easy relatively speaking. But we actually have teams that we're developing. I'm investing in a team that's going to do nothing but go off and research analytics. Right? So if you take the complex interactions that we're talking about, what are the use case scenarios of where we might be able to make this whole system much more predictive? So we've got some low-hanging fruit, again, as Andrew Jay said, the Americanism. Of a, you know, in, we have some easy things to attack, but I think we're really on early days of what we can get when we do that. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. Again, this is, uh, again, the, 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 if you nothing else, walk away with the idea that there's three green blobs here. It's a, uh, um, you know, but it's a combination of ed connected products, edge control, apps, analytics, and services. Uh, is our architecture that we uh, use. And again, ultimately, what ecostructure, I mean, this is why we're investing in ecostructure, right? I mean, uh, I, I get asked this question, hey, you guys were talking about structureware, and I think Dave talked about this last night. You guys, you, didn't you do this when you did structureware? Right? And the way I think about this is, structureware was about how do we start integrating these systems that were historically not very well integrated? The BMS system, the power management system, and, and the IT management systems. And we did a pretty good job integrating those. You know, in fact, I asked one of our teams, I said, 10 years ago, how many of our customers wanted an integrated system? And the answer was, 10 years ago, about 10% did. I said, okay, now the RFPs that we're getting, how many want some good level of integration? The answer is 85%. So we actually you know, were successful at integrating these systems. It's not perfect, certainly better than it was 10 years ago. Ecostructure now is about, we had to not only to integrate those systems, but we got to enable them in the cloud so we can take advantage of some of those technologies that we've got. So this is really what it's about, is you got to collect, connect, analyze, take action, and then when we take action, you connect it back to uh, uh, doing something. I think this is a fairly, you know, model, good model that you have to think about in terms of how these uh, software tools need to evolve. Um, so again, we have the overall ecostructure architecture, so that cuts across data centers, buildings, industrial process control and the grid. Uh, we also look at it specifically within data centers. Again, our, our view of the world is there's three major architectural block to a data center. So there's the kind of the cooling piece, the facility power, and then there's what you're doing in the white space. So those are how we approach the world and think about it in terms of architectural blocks. We do a lot of work to make sure that we bring those three together. And um, within data center, again, we've historically thought about this as ecostructure building, power, and IT as kind of our domains of expertise. We're one of the, you know, it's, it's one of the great things about Schneider is we have this within our portfolio. So when we start running into challenges, we can uh, work internally much more easily to, to solve those. But I do believe, and we are starting to talk about what we're currently doing at the grid is going to need to get tied into ecostructure for data center. So a year from now, I plan on being up here talking about how we're connecting in some of the capabilities that Schneider has on the grid and make that comprehended within uh, what we're doing in the data center world as well. So that's uh, early stages, but I think coming. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. Uh, I'm going to skip this one too. So this is just basically, you know, talk about the value proposition. But basically, uh, we do believe when we start pulling all those together, and particularly if I'm right in that the IT world is going to start becoming much more dynamic in its power, being able to you know, understand what the impact is across the infrastructure will become more important. So maybe if I can consolidate all the VMs in the one little part of the data center, maybe I actually shut down the rest of the data center. And then when, that, when the demand goes back up and it starts turning back on, I start turning the data center back on. Maybe we need to get that dynamic um, in, in what we're doing. So we think this integrated system is going to need to be done. 
Um, again, we have it for cloud and service providers. We've got examples of that today. More things you can't see. This is what I wanted to get to. Um, so the way this is going to work is that you know, our, our architecture drives that we're going to have these sets of connected products in different ways in the architectures. We are not limiting this just to Schneider. I think as Dave said, if you're, if you're a wise person, 80% will take that right, as, as Schneider gear. But certainly we recognize there's going to be third-party stuff out there that you have to use. So we do uh, uh, embrace third-party and connecting those in. We're going to put those into an eco-structured data lake. This is how we're envisioning the architecture. And then we're going to have applications that run on top of that data lake. One's IT expert and one's IT advisor. And uh, what we're also working on, because we know we're not perfect, right, and uh, is we're going to develop an open API and an SDK. And uh, you know, one of the things, one of my roles, by the way, is I'm on the uh, uh, I have my counterparts in the other divisions, six divisions within Schneider. And uh, uh, I work with the other five CTOs. And this is something we're trying to do at the corporate level, is make sure we got a consistent API. So if you go in and you want to know about power, whether it's the medium voltage switchgear, low voltage switchgear breaker, the UPS, it'll all be a similar API so that you, you get some consistency. And we, I think this is one of the most important things we can do. Because um, what that's going to enable us to do is make integration in with third parties easier. If you have an application or specific need that we don't meet, allow you to write that application. And this is going to start rolling out in Q1. Okay, so we're starting down this path. And we are going to go to software as a service in this case. And when we go to software as a service, just like when you use Chrome, you automatically get the updates on Chrome. That's what we're envisioning is you'll automatically see these new features just roll out as we go. So we started with piloting some things over the last year. I'm hitting the wrong button. That's what it is. Um, again, so you have two products, expert and advisor, and then there'll be these add-on modules that we can bring out. Okay, so you can kind of pay and scale as you want to. You can turn, turn on a module. Next month, if you don't like it, you turn it off. This is our vision of how it should be working. And uh, here's the example I was talking about earlier, the uh, uh, account that's got uh, 40 megawatts of local edge data centers. So we did a pilot of this. This is what Structure On was. Structure On was basically a pilot of where we are, of this first stage of this vision that we're driving towards. The, just by going off and doing some very basic things, these are the results that they got. By going to a cloud-based management platform, they could not have gotten these results without that. Store stability went up by 88%. Average UPS faults from 70 to 10. They freed up 5,600 hours of labor. This is how they viewed it, by implementing this. And the ability to manage global standards and security settings for 2,300 devices with ease. Okay. So the ability to lock down things, have visibility, and in this case, I think you need, you know, in this case, they're utilizing some of our staff to augment their staff. So we've had cases where it's the exact same application. So the customer is seeing information. Our guys on the other side are seeing information because they wanted to enable us to help them. There's cases where they had a problem at a store. Our guys started reacting to it. The guy opened up his mobile phone and was able to see that our guys were already working on the problem. It was seamless. And I really think this is, you know, we talk about staffing problems. The only way we're going to deal with the staffing issues is by leveraging, you know, using software like this to leverage and give visibility. And whether it's us, a channel partner, some other partner, you know, Andrew Jay was here with CBRE. I mean, we recognize there's going to need to be this ecosystem of people working this. And uh, in some cases, you might want to utilize us. Sometimes you might want to utilize our partner, who's an extension of us, or you might want to use somebody else. But either way, we want to be, be there trying to enable it as uh, best we can, because we think that's uh, uh, what we need to do to meet the industry challenges. And uh, here's a propaganda video, because we can't resist. <laughs> Bainbridge Island is just a beautiful place. I think it's unique because it's so close to Seattle, but yet at the same time, you're just away from it all as well. The Bainbridge Island School District has about 4,000 students. It's a great learning environment. The community takes a lot of pride in education. It's more of a shared learning environment with the families. My name is Alan Silcott. I'm the network supervisor for the Bainbridge Island School District. We have 11 buildings, nine different schools, a central data center, 35 different data closets, Technology is in every aspect of the schools. If our network were to go down for a day, it could cause serious disruption to our learning. We get wind storms and the winds can reach, you know, 40, 50 plus miles an hour. And when that happens, we're almost guaranteed a power outage. If we get even just a power flicker, all of our UPSs throughout the district will send me a notification email. It's kind of hard to sort through all those and make sure that everything came back online safely. We use EcoStructure IT Remote Service and their Mobile Insights app. 
Mobile Insights allows me to check the status of all my data closets from my phone at any time and any location. It does help to know exactly where the problem is as opposed to trying to decipher it from a flood of emails. We have remote service. It's nice to know that if there is an issue that they have our backs and that they're contacting us immediately. It's more about peace of mind. Education is vital to this community. The Schneider Electric products give me that peace of mind to know that if there is an incident, kids can continue to learn and the classrooms can continue to operate until the school day is through. But here it is, you got this guy that's managing this school, right? You know, and I don't know, I mean, if you go to the schools in the U.S. anyway, I mean, everything is on a Chromebook or on an iPad. I mean, if they do get an outage, you know, classes last, what, 30, 40, 50 minutes, and if you get an outage that takes you out for 10 minutes, that's a problem, right? This guy's managing it by himself. He goes home at night, he starts getting a flood of emails saying that all the UPSs went on battery, right? We have stories about people going, what's a UPS and why does it have a battery in it, you know, for some of those. But, you know, at the end of the day, how does he know those problems got resolved? I mean, these are all things that we can solve. You know, very difficult. I can tell you technically, I did software for a while. Very difficult to solve using on-premise software. Just a tough problem. You go into the cloud, it starts making things a little bit easier because you got access to other tools. So uh, this is kind of the summary propaganda slide. But hopefully, um, you know, again, I, mixing in a little bit of sales pitch here, but I hope this gives you a sense of uh, some of the thoughts that we have. And again, there's lots of other thoughts out there in the industry as well that we like to investigate, but I thought uh, this would cover a little bit for you today. So. How do I do on time? Two, I'm three minutes ahead of schedule. So thank you very much. Kevin will be, Kevin will be hosting a table, but if we have some questions, uh, we have a minute or two for some questions. Anyone? That means it was either really good or really bad. <laughs> so I'll let you guys tell me. So we're talking there about uh, renewable energy and the need for the, uh, the grid and the data center supply chain to synchronize it up. One of the things I've been hearing recently is that with the increased amount of renewables going onto the grids, the network itself um, is becoming increasingly stochastic, which means statistically unstable. Yep. Because you know, wind doesn't blow and stuff like that. So that aspect there is a bit about more than just peak demand. Yes. It's about some stability piece through. Is that something you're hearing as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, and, uh, you know, within Schneider, I mean, we're, we're in the midst of deploying microgrids today, you know, in different areas. I mean, pretty much any time you deploy a renewable energy, whether it's solar or wind, two examples, you have to have energy storage there in order to help with frequency regulation and balance out the power, right? The grid does not handle well things coming on and going off, because then I got to have a peaker plant to compensate for that. So, it, you know, there's some complex dynamics happening just on dealing with the renewables side. And then, but again, all those complexities that they're seeing on the renewable side, I think is a good analogy, which the industry is working on and solving, and Schneider is working on to solve. But if data centers do become dynamic in power consumption, the way that I, I'm speculating, right, if that starts happening, you're going to have the exact same issue, both sides, right? And that's why, you know, you have to start thinking about the grid's got to adapt to the data center, and in many ways, you know, if you talk to a microgrid guy, you know, they, they kind of look at the data center and say, hey, that's a microgrid. It's the same thing as a, mi you know, they actually don't view it as a data center. They view it as a power consumption device. So I think there's going to be a bigger issue. Um, and probably where the renewables are is where data centers are heading would be my guess. But we'll see. Okay. Stunned All silence. right. Okay. Very Thanks very good. much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kevin.